So, what's the other way to do what we want? Well, there's a command that will select lines out of a file, not by position, but by content. And it has the stunningly unrememberable name, grep. G-R-E-P was actually a sequence of commands that you typed into an editor in 1970 to do find and replace. So, when they wanted a command on the command line that would do this kind of pattern matching and finding, they said, well, our, all of us are using this editor, we all know GREP, so we'll call the command grep. A lot of my stories aren't true, that's a true story. So, grep marlin in fish.txt will go and find all of the lines that contain the characters M-A-R-L-I-N in that order and show me the matching lines. Grep Cod, we'll do that, and grep shark, we'll do that. Okay, so now I've got a way to find lines that match a certain pattern. But what if I want to get rid of lines? Grep dash v shark in fish.txt gets rid of all of the shark lines. V means invert the match because I means case insensitive and you need to have distinct letters for all of the options. So if I was already taken for case insensitive, V means invert instead of I for invert. So what I've done with grep-v shark fish.txt is get all of the lines that don't contain the letters S-H-A-R-K. Okay. What if I grep-v species in shark in fish.txt? I get all of the lines that don't include the word species. I'm not doing it by position. I'm doing it by value. So now I could say grep-v species in fish.txt to get rid of that line. Pipe that to cut with delimiter comma, field two. Yep, there are my species names. Up arrow, pipe that to sort. Yep, up arrow, pipe that to unique-c. And there you go. There are all of my occurrences. I saw marlins on two days, sharks on three days, and so forth. But look at how I did it. I found a way to solve the particular problem. And then each time I reran the command, I did up arrow to repeat what I had and added a bit more to it. So I'm growing my command line to get what I want. I've now got a command here. which does the job, and I trust it because I grew it in stages. If you take a look at history, you can see that I checked that I was getting rid of the species, then I checked that I was getting the right column, and then I did the sort and unique pair, which is a very common idiom, a very common combination of commands, in order to get the count of unique occurrences. And I trust this because I didn't do it all at once and just look at the output. I trust it because I built it up in stages and checked my intermediate stages. This is a pattern you need to get into. This is a habit you need to develop. Just as you do long calculations in intermediate stages so that you'll trust it. Just as when you're building a piece of equipment in the lab, you put a few components together, test that that's working, put a few more together, test that they're working, and then combine the two sub-assemblies to create the final piece of equipment. You don't build the telescope and then test it. You check the lenses one by one to make sure they're okay before you put them in the tube. And when you put them in the tube, you check each one to make sure it's positioned properly, and then you do your final test. The way to get reliable code is to do the process the right way. If you build it the right way, it has a much higher chance of being reliable. And this is what you've learned to do in science labs ever since high school. In a chemistry lab, you're taught to clean the test tubes, to weigh the samples, to check the purity of the samples, to calibrate the instruments, and so forth. People trust your experimental results because they trust that you've done the procedures correctly and cleanly. You can tell a lot about whether or not a particular paper that you're reviewing is likely to be correct or not by asking a few questions about the how. I don't think it's practical to expect the people reviewing papers to read 
2,000 lines of code or 20,000 lines or 200,000 lines of code every time they're reviewing the paper. It would take weeks. I think it is reasonable for the people who are reviewing the paper or the thesis or any other piece of work to go back and ask some questions about the process that the author used. Did you build your program out of components, each of which was tested before being assembled? Do you have a record, like history into second record dot text, of what steps you did? Can you show that to me? Can you show me the commands you ran in order? And do those commands completely capture all of the steps? If at some point you dropped into a GUI tool and magic happened and an answer popped out at the end, I have no way of checking the how inside that GUI tool. If you're using some sort of text-based or script-based tool, you don't have to write a program. You can do things interactively, but then you capture that record and save it so that I can come back and see how you did things. And if there are gaps in that record, I think I have a right to be suspicious about your results because there's no way for me to check the process by which you created those results. So let's get rid of that file secondrecord.tech. There's our fish.txt file. And as we've seen, we have two ways to get the count. One is this, which gets rid of species and then counts everything else. And the other was the one using tail. Hmm. That's probably up in my history someplace, and I could type history and then scroll backwards to try to find it. But why don't I just type history, pipe to, grep for tail. History will show me the history of my commands. Its output is being sent to grep, which finds lines that match a pattern. And the pattern I want to match is the word T-A-I-L. Okay, the last command that I ran that used tail is in fact this one. Because what the shell does is add the command to the history and then run it so that if the command crashes, there's a record of what crashed. If you wait until the command completes and then add it to the history record and the command crashes, it might not show up in history, which would be a bad thing. The second to last command that I ran that used tail is number 149. So if I want to repeat that, I type bang 149. Okay, there's my answer. So I've now got two ways to calculate the same answer. So what I'm going to do is say, run that. This is the one that does the cut and the sort and then gets rid of species by getting rid of the first line of output. Save that to tail at the end.txt. Then I'm going to go back to this one, which is the one that gets rid of the word species and then processes the rest of the data, and save that to grep at the start.txt. These two files should be the same. Well, according to WC, they both have six lines. Okay, they both have 13 words, they both have 71 characters, so they're exactly the same size. That isn't a guarantee they're the same file, but they're exactly the same size diff, tail at the end, then grep at the start. Diff shows the differences between text files. Okay, there's no output, excuse me. That means there are no differences between the files. If I diff, tail at the end, and fish.txt, you can see that all of the lines are different. The less than means here's a line that's in the first file that isn't in the second. The greater than means here's a line that's in the second file that isn't in the first. So these two files differ completely. And that line at the top is a series of edit commands that say lines 1 to 6 are changed into lines 1 to 10. And then it shows you the lines. The output is a little difficult to read. But the diff command will, the most important thing about it is diff will show you nothing if there are no differences. So now I've got two separate ways to calculate what should be the same result. When I diff them, there are no differences. I've now got much more confidence in the result. Okay. So I'm going to get rid of those two files. RM grep and tail. Oh. Hmm. Is there a better way to do that? There actually is, but we'll come back to it in a bit. I'm back to just my file fish.txt.